Orford Ness, a 10 mile long shingle spit on the Suffolk coast. One of the most extraordinary places in Britain. For the greater part of the 20th century, it was one of the most secret experimental military sites in the country. Here armed guards, not commonplace in Britain, discouraged outside interest. As boffins worked to challenge and change the course of world history. Today, you can still see the specialist buildings, unique structures that were built to experiment, test, and conceal the truth. Possibly some of the most significant experiments conducted at Orford Ness took place under the auspices of the Ionospheric Research Station, set up by the brilliant Robert Watson Watt. At a committee meeting of the Scientific Study of Air Defence, it was suggested to Watson Watt that a Nikola Tesla idea called the death ray might be developed to stop enemy aircraft. It is commonly believed that this was a radio energy beam that could eliminate aircraft by frying them. But my research has found it's more likely to be an EM pulse device that disrupted electrical circuits possibly over a great distance. Watson Watt was to test the plans given or sold to the UK government by Tesla. He chose the clandestine site, Orford Ness. After bothering a hapless flock of Suffolk sheep, he rejected the death ray as impractical. Due to enormous energy transmission demands and the shortcomings of the technology available at the time. But he suggested there was potential to use a modified system of the Tesla death ray as a radio detection system. The Ionospheric Research Station was built as a cover for the development of radio detection systems that briefly became RDF, Radio Direction Finding, and we now know today, Radar, Radio Detection and Ranging. The world's first ever purpose-built radar masts were installed at Orford Ness in 1935 built by Harland and Wolfe of Belfast. In 1945, Orford Ness was handed over to the Royal Aircraft Establishment, RAE, a government research organisation that had various names and roles during its lifetime. In 1953, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment, AWRE, moved in and appears to have had exclusive control of this site. This is the shadowy Cold War period at Orford Ness. Despite Britain's crucial contribution to the US-funded Manhattan Project during World War II, which produced the world's first nuclear weapons, wartime collaboration in this area ended 
after the death of President Roosevelt in 1945, when the Americans refused to share the plans of the atomic bomb. Despite Britain's precarious economic state at the time, and despite the ambitious commitments made by the new Labour government, including the creation of the National Health Service, in 1946, a secret cabinet committee decided that Britain should pursue its own independent atomic program. The earliest research took place here in North Wales under the codename Tube Alloys. Their job was to figure out the chemistry of uranium enrichment. The nuclear weapons were built here. At a place known by its workers as the Bomb Factory in the small village of Aldermaston. Much practical information was missing from the British Atomic Bomb Program. They needed to develop, build and test their own focused implosion explosives and fashion an atom bomb casing that could be safely dropped from a British V-bomber. Flying out of Farnborough, our V-bombers would carry mock-ups of British atom bombs to Orford Ness for drop testing. There were inevitably a few accidents. One inert atom bomb fell off its bomb bay hook and rested precariously on the bomb bay doors forcing the pilots to drop it into the Thames estuary, where it lies today, undiscovered in the London clay and mud. Another was accidentally dropped a bit early and fell short into a Suffolk farmer's field. But this was all hush-hush, taking place at a time when nobody really spilled the beans. Orford Ness is one of the few places where purpose-built facilities were created for testing atomic weapons and their components. Blue Danube, Britain's first atomic bomb, was lowered by crane into these specially constructed pagoda roof pits to be tested. Tests were designed to imitate the extreme conditions such weapons would be subject to prior to detonation. Vibration, high temperatures, shocks, g-forces. It has always been maintained that no fissile material was involved in tests, but high explosive initiators were present, and any accident could have had devastating consequences to the Suffolk Seagulls. Against the odds, Britain's first atomic bomb was successfully detonated on the 3rd of October 1952. In the Monte Bello Islands off the northwest coast of Australia, Carelessly, fallout spread inland and badly affected Aboriginal villages. As the Cold War got rather hot, Orford Ness was found to be ideally suited for advanced radar testing. Isolated, secret and, most importantly, facing Eastern Europe. From 1968, an Anglo-American project codenamed Cobra Mist occupied a huge area on the northern edge of the Ness. 
This involved a top secret over the horizon OTH backscatter radar system called 441 Alpha. It was extremely expensive and apparently plagued by severe noise probably caused by a Soviet blocking device, which ultimately led to its premature closure. In fact, it probably never worked and was scrapped a few days after it was turned on. Inside information suggests the Soviets had detailed knowledge of the frequencies Cobra Mist used, rendering it useless before it could be used against them. Inevitably, there are other stories about Orford Ness. Rumours of a World War II secret German invasion of England, and the infamous UFO sighting in nearby Rendlesham Forest. I was told by an unnamed Orford radio technician the location of this UFO sighting is perfectly aligned with the high-power Cobra Mist radar beam, which often cause strange electrical discharges in the form of glowing lights on local houses' TV aerials. Other countries have developed successful over-the-horizon radar. Here is a short film from the French radar station and a good explanation of how the system works. Nostradamus was designed and built by the French Aerospace Research Agency, ONERA, for the Ministry of Defense. It is made up of 288 emitting and receiving antennas, placed in a star pattern in three equally spaced arms. Each antenna emits a low-frequency electromagnetic wave from 3 to 30 megahertz. The advantage of these low-frequency signals is that they reflect off the ionosphere at altitudes ranging from 100 to 300 kilometers. This gigantic virtual mirror reflects a signal that illuminates a quadrangle of approximately 500 kilometers on one side. Any vehicle moving within the radar field sends an echo back to the receiving antennas. Depending on the wave's frequency and angle of emission, the signal will be reflected off different layers in the ionosphere, which means that the radar can target zones 800 to 3,000 kilometers away. A powerful computer automatically calibrates the system and also chooses the frequency according to propagation conditions. Nostradamus is a real, all-weather radar. The waves emitted by the radar are the sum total of the output signals of all antennas in service. The system's supercomputer coordinates all antennas in each of the equidistant arms. This means that the resulting signal can be sent in any direction over 360 degrees. At a range of 800 kilometers, the radar covers a circular area of about 2,200 kilometers wide. Since this is a true all-weather omnidirectional radar, it can be used for a number of functions. Detection is based on the Doppler principle and is easier the faster the object is moving. When set in a fixed position over a given zone, it can track the paths of all aircraft flying over that zone. With Nostradamus, the research carried out by the Department of Electromagnetism and Radar of ONERA continues to push the boundaries of radar detection well beyond the horizon. Today, visitors can walk on the Orford Shingle Beach Nature Reserve. There are scarce hints to its illustrious past. But buried under the stones are dark secrets of a hidden history.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed making it, and I'd like to reach out to some people who have really helped. First of all, to John Griffin, who's a volunteer at the National Trust at Orford Ness. He really knows the history of the place. Thank you, John. And to Vol Air Auto Drones. Thank you so much for letting me use your amazing drone footage of the secret sites. And as always, a giant thank you to Tony Anthony Del Duca, who's a fantastic composer and knows exactly the mood and style of my films. Thanks, mate. But there's some invisible people behind the scenes who really help. And that's my Patreons. Thank you all so much. Without your help, I could not make these films. Via Patreon, we have built a community of inquiring minds, a science club of great people who suggest film contents, ask great questions, do research, and actually help make these films. If you would like to get involved, click on this link below or in the description, and for only one dollar, one pound a month, join this growing community of inquiring minds. Everybody has a skill from their past, their career, or their interests that can contribute to make fabulous films for YouTube. And here's just a small selection of names of patrons who have really helped. Thank you so much.